Hello and welcome to the introduction on how to use the slide navigation and interactive features in Storyline 360. At the top of the slide, you can see the module number, lesson number, and lesson name, indicating the current lesson. The player bar is located at the bottom of the screen. It includes the play pause button on the left, the seek bar that allows you to control the slide timeline by dragging it, and the replay button to restart the slide. You can adjust the volume by clicking on the speaker icon. To enable closed captions, simply press the CC button. You can also adjust the playback speed by clicking this button here. Additionally, there is a full-size screen option available by clicking the screen icon on the right-hand side. If you want to skip slides, there are two options available. The first option is to use the next or previous buttons located at the bottom right corner of the slide. You can navigate through the slides one by one using these buttons. The second option is to open the menu bar by clicking the highlighted icon at the top left corner. In the menu, you will find a list of slide sections. Note that the current slide will be highlighted, whilst the slides you have already viewed are marked with ticks. By opening the menu bar, you can jump to any slide you wish to visit in this lesson. However, it is possible that some lessons may have this feature restricted until you have viewed the slides in the prescribed order. If you click on the transcript tab on the right side of the menu, you will have access to the transcript. To search for specific slides in the lesson, click on the magnifying glass icon and enter the keyword to initiate the search. If there are resources available for the lesson, you can easily access them by clicking the Resources button at the top right corner. When a hand cursor appears on a slide, you can click it to jump to the corresponding timestamps. This feature allows you to quickly navigate to the mentioned points or highlighted sections on the timeline. If you would like to learn more about EIT's world-leading education and training courses, click on the screen or visit us at our website. We look forward to supporting your professional development journey. From all of us at the Egler Institute of Technology, we wish you all the best for your studies. Hi and welcome to the Egler Institute of Technology's Excel for Practitioners on-demand course. Microsoft Excel is a spreadsheeting software from Microsoft that is heavily utilized throughout the workplace. It is very versatile and is utilized for everything from simple data entry to complex engineering analysis. Microsoft Excel is widely used by professionals in both government and business to assist in the analysis and presentation of information in the areas of finance, procurement, science, and engineering, just to mention a few. This fascinating course will guide you on a deep dive through the absolutely critical foundational skills, all the way through to more complex methods utilized for analysis and data visualization, such as pivot tables and goal seek. As we proceed through the course, you will often hear me refer to this wonderful software as either Microsoft Excel or simply Excel for short. So be ready for me to use these two terms interchangeably as we proceed through the course. Once again, welcome to the course, and I am looking forward to accompanying you on your learning journey. Over the next hour, we will be covering the following topics. We will start with an overview of what Excel is and how it is often utilized by people around the world working in complex organizations. We will then begin building on our foundational Excel skills. The main aim of the game is to master how we prepare datasets for analysis. This analysis may take form in terms of utilizing various statistical formula to determine information like averages, maximums, etc. We may also be interested in visualizing this data in terms of outputting graphs that enable us to view trends, and so on. But all of this begins with us being able to take raw data and preparing for this analysis. This will almost always require us to create a table. Tables are one of the most effective ways of representing two or more pieces of data with a relationship. So, we need to understand how to enter data into Excel and how to format a table. Tables are very interesting tools that we leverage in Excel, and we need to understand how to manipulate them for maximum benefit. 
Raw data is often recorded in a manner that is difficult to understand and analyze, so we will explore how to sort and condition data. Lastly, we will cover how to improve the readability of our Excel spreadsheet by understanding how to employ basic formatting and styling. Microsoft Excel, or Excel for short, was initially released by Microsoft in the late 90s to allow companies to conduct spreadsheeting operations. Spreadsheeting allows users to create, manage, organize, and analyze data. For example, retail stores may do inventory management and analysis within an Excel spreadsheet. An engineering organization may utilize Excel spreadsheets to perform stress analysis on structures. An accounting organization may use Excel spreadsheets to conduct end-of-year tax analysis on government or company finances. Throughout all these examples, the raw data is imported into the spreadsheet, organized in a tabular format, in preparation for analysis and visualization. As you can see, it makes perfect sense how Excel has become an indispensable tool for the day-to-day -day operation of governments and companies. Earlier, I mentioned that Excel is well known for its versatility, and this was no exaggeration. Here you can see the most common tasks that organizations around the world perform using Excel. These include data entry and analysis. Excel is a powerful tool for entering, organizing, and analyzing data. It provides a grid-like interface where users can input text, numbers, and other types of data into cells. This data can then be easily sorted, filtered, and analyzed. Mathematical and Statistical Calculations Excel includes a wide range of mathematical and statistical functions. Users can perform calculations, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, as well as more complex operations like financial calculations and statistical analysis. Charting and Data Visualization Excel allows users to create various types of charts and graphs, including bar charts, pie charts, line charts, and more. These visual representations make it easier to understand and communicate data trends. Financial and accounting tasks. Excel is commonly used for tasks like budgeting, financial modeling, and accounting. Its ability to handle complex calculations and create financial reports makes it invaluable for finance professionals. Project management. Excel can be used for project planning and tracking. Users can create Gantt charts, to-do lists, and timelines to manage tasks and deadlines effectively. Inventory and resource management. Excel is used for tracking inventory, assets, and resources in businesses. It helps in monitoring stock levels, reorder points, and asset depreciation. As you can see, Excel is a flexible and powerful tool used for tasks that involve data management, analysis, and presentation. However, the versatility is not the only reason for the widespread adoption of Excel by organizations. Here are some of the key benefits. Familiarity and accessibility. Many employees are already familiar with Excel, reducing training costs and making it an accessible tool for organizations. User-friendly interface. Excel's intuitive grid-based interface is accessible to both beginners and experienced users. It doesn't require extensive technical expertise to get started. Cost-effective. Excel is part of the Microsoft Office suite, often already in use within organizations, thus reducing additional software expenses. Customization and automation. Excel's capacity for customization and automation improves productivity and reduces the potential for errors, enhancing efficiency within the organization. These attributes make Excel an attractive and cost-effective tool for organizations, contributing to improved data management, analysis, and decision-making processes. Now that we have established the significance of Excel, Let's familiarize ourselves with the fundamentals when operating the software. Chances are that you have already got some experience working with Excel. If that is the case, feel free to skip through to the next section. However, if you come across some topics that you are unfamiliar with, it may be worth having a listen. 
The next few slides will review how to navigate the Excel user interface within an Excel workbook, as well as highlight the terminology of the various menus. We will highlight how to open, save, and close workbooks that you may be operating in, as well as how to create, rename, and delete spreadsheets within the workbook. Lastly, we will highlight the usefulness of an inbuilt tool called the status bar. If all these words don't mean an awful lot to you right now, don't worry. It is all very intuitive and will not take long to pick up these skills and terminology as you watch the very helpful videos over the next few slides. First things first, we want to familiarize ourselves with what to expect when we open up Excel for the first time. What are all these grids for? What are those letters and numbers? What is a tab and ribbon? Where does the data go? All these questions and more are covered in this very comprehensive tutorial video. It will succinctly cover topics such as how to create and save workbooks, what are sheets, the structure of the grid, as well as common terminologies used in the day-to-day -day operation of Excel. If all those things are familiar to you, just remember that you can skip this video. Otherwise, let's dive in. So whenever you start up Excel, it should take you first to a screen similar to this one. You may see a list of recently used spreadsheets, but you'll also have a way to create a new blank workbook. And I'm gonna click here just to show that there will often also be templates that you can click to open up and use. You can also search, and there's a button here to more templates. But I'm just gonna click blank workbook to open up a brand new, completely blank workbook in Microsoft Excel. And before we create anything in this workbook, let's talk about the anatomy of a spreadsheet. When you're working in Microsoft Excel, you will always have at least one sheet. You can see here in the lower left, it says sheet one, but it's possible to have multiple sheets. And all of those sheets collectively together are called a workbook. Right now, my workbook just has the one spreadsheet. In Excel, spreadsheets are made up of columns. You can see this is column E, this is column C, this is column K. And when I select the letter for that column, the entire column gets selected. We also have rows in Excel. This is row three, this is row nine, this is row 10. So every column has a column letter and every row has a row number. Now the intersection of a column and a row is what we call a cell. So for example, this cell here is the intersection of column E and row 10. And an Excel workbook can contain over 17 billion cells. When you click on a cell, that becomes the active cell. Now one of the most powerful things about the cells in Excel is that each one can be described by the intersection of its column and row. So for example, this is cell F8, and that's how you say it, F8. What cell is this? This is cell L4, and this is cell B7. Now because of this fact that you can describe every single cell in Microsoft Excel, there's a lot of exciting possibilities that come about because of that, and you'll see that as you begin using Excel more. The next part of the anatomy of a spreadsheet is range. A range is a collection of cells that are generally grouped together. So I've clicked and dragged to select a group of cells in Excel. This is a range. And we can also describe every range in Microsoft Excel. Once again, using the column letters and the row numbers. The way you do this is you start in the upper left corner of the range and you describe that cell. So D4 through, and then you go to the lower right corner and describe that cell, J14. So the description of this range, its reference basically, is D4 through J14. And in Excel, the way you indicate through is with a colon. So D4 through J14. This is very important and will become more and more useful and important as you keep using Excel. So that is the anatomy of a spreadsheet. We have columns, we have rows, we have cells. The cell that you've selected is the active cell, and we have ranges. And all of this is done on a sheet or spreadsheet, or it's also called worksheet. You can add more worksheets by clicking this plus sign. Now I have two sheets, now I have three sheets, and the collection of all of these sheets together is what we call a workbook. 
Now, in addition to the anatomy of the spreadsheet, it's also important to understand the layout that we have to work with in Microsoft Excel. As you use Excel, you'll notice that there are tabs across the top of the screen. Generally, you'll start on the Home tab, but we also have the Insert tab, Page Layout tab, Data tab, etc. Whenever you click a tab, the tool buttons that you have here below change, and this part of the layout is called the Ribbon. So if I click the Formulas tab, I get the Formulas ribbon. If I click the View tab, the ribbon completely changes. Now I have the View ribbon. And each ribbon is divided up into groups. You can see the groups are separated by lines. So I have a Charts group, I have a Tours group, a Comments group, a Tables group, etc. Now, not all of the options can fit in such a small group. For example, my charts group is not big enough to hold all of the options. So some of the groups have what I call a launch button, or sometimes it's called a dialog launcher, but I'll just call it a launch button. Not all of the groups have these launch buttons, but if you click on a launch button, it'll open up with even more options than could normally fit in the space provided on the ribbon. In addition to the tabs, the ribbons, and the groups, and the launch buttons, we also have some other layout features that you really need to know. Over here on the right, we have a scroll bar that you can use to move down your spreadsheet and up the spreadsheet. We also have a horizontal scroll bar. Underneath that, we have a zoom slider. If I slide this to the right, I zoom in on the spreadsheet. If I slide it to the left, I zoom out on the spreadsheet. Doing this does not change the data at all. It just zooms in or out. I have some view buttons here in the lower right corner. I can go to page break preview or the page layout view, but most Excel users spend most of their time in normal view. Here in the upper left, we have what's called the name box. Whenever you click on a cell, you can look in the name box to see the description of that cell or the name for that cell. And later you'll learn that this name box can do even more for you. Here at the top of my Excel layout, I have the quick access toolbar and I have customized this. Yours may look different, but this gives me quick access to some of the most commonly used features in Microsoft Excel, my save button, an undo button, auto sum, and more. Here's my title for this spreadsheet. Over here I have my close button. It looks like an X. If I click that, the spreadsheet will close. And then finally, here I have a very special bar called the formula bar. In many cases, this is where you'll go to enter formulas into Microsoft Excel. So now that you know about the anatomy of a spreadsheet and also the layout in Microsoft Excel, you're completely ready to begin learning to use Excel. At this point, I'm gonna click File and Save. But because this is my first time saving this document, it's having me do a save as. I need to decide where to save this Excel workbook. So I'm gonna click on Browse, and I'm just gonna save it in My Documents. And I'll just write a name for it, Excel for Beginners, Complete Course, and Save. Save your work, and save it often. Losing unsaved work is one of life's harsh lessons in the professional world. There is no worse feeling than having done a lot of great work and then unexpectedly losing it. So, it is critical to know how to save your work. With that said, more often than not, it is typically uncontrollable circumstances such as power blackouts or computer failures that put our work at risk. That is why we want to ensure that our save settings are correct, in particular, the autosave settings. This great video will go through manual saving, as well as autosave settings and saving to cloud systems. Check it out now! In this video, I'm going to demonstrate options for saving files, including different file types, autosave settings, and for 365 users, we'll look at version history. When you create a new workbook, it'll be given a default name, book1 or book2.xlsx, etc. The first thing you need to do is save it. For this, go to the File tab and then click Save, or you can use the keyboard shortcut Control s When you press Control s for the first time, it's going to ask you where you want to save the workbook. It's opened the dialog box where I can choose the folder that I want to save it in. I can give the file a name. Now you don't need to have the .xlsx on the end. When you press save, that will automatically be appended. So you can just type over this your new name, choose your file type. You can choose from any of these file types. 
The default is .xlsx. If you have macros in your workbook, then you'll want to save it as a .xlsm. You can save it as a binary or a CSV. There's lots to choose from there, so I'll let you browse through them. Once you're ready, click Save. Once you save your workbook, you'll see the name in the top here. It says Saved. When I make changes to the workbook, because I'm an Office 365 user, it's set to auto save. Now you can toggle that on and off using the button in the top left. When I make a change with auto save turned on, you can see I've typed in some numbers in the cell, I press enter, and now it's showing it that it's saving. It's saving a copy of my file up to OneDrive or SharePoint, depending on where I've saved it. If you're not an Office 365 user, then you're going to want to get into the habit of saving frequently. So keyboard shortcut control S, or you can click the save icon in the quick access toolbar. If you don't like having auto save on, then you can go to the file tab and down in the options, you want to go save. You can deselect auto save OneDrive and SharePoint online files by default. Notice that in this dialog box here, you can also choose your auto recovery frequency, change the minutes to anything you want. Choose whether you keep the last auto recovered version and where to place that file. Don't show the backstage when opening or saving files with keyboard shortcuts. So you saw that when I pressed Control S, it opened the dialog box. If you don't have that checked, it's going to take you to the file backstage area for save. And that's similar to save a copy. You'll see a dialog like this. So now that we're here, if you want to save a copy, this is what we do. We go to save a copy, give the file a new name, choose the workbook type. We can click here on the slug to change where we're saving the file to. And it's going to open the dialog box that we saw earlier. We can choose the location there. Or we can go back, I'll show you the other option. We can navigate to a recent location. These are my 365 locations for OneDrive and SharePoint. You can choose a location on this PC, add a location or browse to a new location. The keyboard shortcut for save a copy is F12. So you don't need to go file and then save a copy. You can just click F12 and it will open the save as dialog box. For Office 365 users, you can see up here if I click on the drop down, I've got my file name. I can actually modify my file name here. Just type in a new file name and it will automatically update it. It's showing me the location my file is and I can access version history through this link. This is just for Office 365 users. So that wraps up saving files and saving copies of files. As you know, an Excel workbook contains many sheets. Although we start with a single sheet one by default, you will need to be comfortable with adding, deleting, renaming sheets as your workflow requires. This very nice video covers all the key features and operations that we will need to know on the way to Sheet Management Mastery. In this video, you will learn how to add, delete, and rename worksheets in Excel. An Excel workbook is organized into separate worksheets. These worksheets can be added, deleted, and renamed. Let's get started. One way to add a worksheet is by using the New Sheet Control. To do this, click the plus sign icon to the right of the Last Sheet tab. This adds a new worksheet to your workbook. As you can see, Sheet 4 has been added. A second way to add a worksheet is by using the ribbon. To do this, go to the Home tab. Then go to the Cells group, click the Insert Down arrow, then select Insert Sheet. You can see that a new worksheet, Sheet 5, has been added. A third way to add a worksheet is from the Sheet tab. To do this, right-click a Sheet tab, then select Insert. The Insert dialog box appears. In the General tab, Select Worksheet, then select OK. A new worksheet, Sheet 6, has been added. Now that you've learned how to add worksheets, let's look at how to delete worksheets. One way to delete a worksheet is from a Sheet tab. To do this, 
right click the sheet tab of the worksheet that you want to delete. So here I will right click sheet 6 then select delete. Sheet 6 has now been deleted. A second way to delete a worksheet is by using the ribbon. To do this first select the sheet tab of the worksheet that you want to delete. I will select sheet 5 then go to the home tab then to the cells group then click the delete down arrow, then click Delete Sheet. Sheet 5 has now been deleted. Now let's look at how to rename worksheets. One way to rename a worksheet is by using the ribbon. To do this, go to the Home tab, then go to the Cells group, and then click the Format Down arrow, then select Rename Sheet. You can see that Sheet 1 has been highlighted. We can now rename the sheet then hit enter. The worksheet has now been renamed. A second way to rename a worksheet is by right clicking the sheet tab. To do this select the sheet that you want to rename. I will select sheet 3, right click it, then select rename. Then I will rename it to sales, hit enter, and the worksheet has been renamed. A third way to rename a worksheet is by double clicking the sheet tab. Here I will double click Sheet 2, then rename it, hit Enter, and the worksheet has been renamed. This is probably the quickest way to rename a worksheet. A few more things to note. Sheet names have a 31 character limit. Additionally, the following characters are not allowed. Question mark, asterisk, backslash, slash, square brackets, and colon. So please keep this in mind when renaming your worksheets. The final topic that is very important to be familiar with is that of the status bar. This very helpful feature within Excel provides a lot of great insights about datasets as we are working. Even better, we are able to customize it to best meet our needs as we engage with our work tasks. Have a look at this awesome video that highlights how useful it can be. Is just click on the column H and look what it does. Down here on what we call the status bar, we have some automatic information that's brought to us by Excel. And one of those bits of information is the count. So it tells me right there there's a count of 701 records in column H. It also gives me the sum of all of the numbers that are in column H. And so that's a huge sum that I have there. And it gives me the average of the numbers in column H. That's with zero work on my part. There's no formula. There's no functions used. I simply just click on the column letter, J, K, and it gives me that information. Now what if I pick a column that has only words, like column A or B? Then it can't give me as much data, but it does give me a count still. Just so you know, you can customize the information that it does give you. You can right click on the status bar and it gives you the opportunity to make some changes to the information that's brought to you. I'm going to click here on sale price to illustrate that a little bit better. I can now right click and I could add minimum and maximum. And so now I can look at this and see the cheapest thing that's for sale in this spreadsheet sells for $7 and the most expensive sells for $350. So in some cases this status bar will give you all the information you need and you won't need to create a count or count a formula. In other cases you will need to. Okay. Now that we have reviewed the fundamentals behind navigating the Excel interface, let's get to work. The ultimate aim for us throughout this course is to be able to take some data and analyze it to glean useful information. This first hour of the course is focused on taking our data and entering it into a table in preparation for further analysis. The process of taking the data and entering it into Excel is called, unsurprisingly, data entry. The great news is that by establishing good practices when it comes to data entry, we can make it relatively painless. This is critically important 
as we will often be working with very large and very unwieldy datasets that need to be processed. So, I encourage you to really keep in mind the fact that although some tips and tricks may seem trivial now, the real payoff comes when we begin working with very big datasets. We will be looking at how you enter and remove data from the spreadsheet. There may also be issues when entering data around what can and cannot be seen due to the size or length of the information. So, we will be discussing how to adjust the spreadsheet area so that all the data is visible for the reader. The process of data entry itself is reasonably straightforward. However, like all things in life, we can make it easy or harder for ourselves. So, throughout this course, I will also be drawing your attention to specific tips and tricks that will make your life easier. Don't forget to test out the methods that we talk about in your Excel fundamentals. Practice and play workbook as we go along, so you can practice and reinforce your newly acquired skills. The first thing we need to understand is how data is stored within an Excel spreadsheet. Each spreadsheet contains a range of cells. Each cell is designated by a particular column letter and row number. As we can see on the screen, the cell that is currently highlighted corresponds to column B and row 2. Therefore, we refer to this specific cell as B2. Once we have selected a cell by clicking on it, we are able to enter data into it by typing on our keyboard. We will typically be entering numbers and text into cells as part of the preparation process for further data analysis. It is also worth mentioning the concept of cell types. Excel is quite clever and will determine the cell type based on the input you have provided. This is used by Excel to predict future outputs and behaviors when entered into formulas. For example, if you enter a number into a cell, it will have a number type. If you enter text into a cell, it will have a text type. If you enter a date, it will have a date type. Excel usually designates the cell types correctly by itself, but if you need to adjust the cell types manually, this is absolutely possible. More on this later. There are two methods for entering data into a cell. The first method, you simply select the cell that you would like to enter data into and begin typing. Let's assume that you wrote the word test. You will notice that the cell contents will be replaced with the word test. However, let's say that you noticed a typo and it should actually have been tests. If you use this method to try and correct the typo, it will overwrite any existing text. This is not a big deal for a small amount of text such as test, but you could imagine this would be very annoying if you had a large paragraph that needed to be retyped. Method 2, on the other hand, allows us to edit the content of a cell without overriding the whole thing. To access the contents of a cell for editing, all you need to do is simply double-click the cell. This will result in a cursor becoming visible within the cell contents, and you will then be able to click and modify the cell content as desired. To finalize your edits, simply click anywhere else on the spreadsheet or hit Enter on your keyboard. As we are entering data into our spreadsheet, we often want to utilize what we call transformations. These are functions that we are able to perform that manipulate information that has already been inputted in some manner. These transformations can be performed to either single cells or can be applied by selecting multiple cells in a range. Let's have a look at some of the most common transformations and key things to keep in mind. Copy transformation. Once a cell has been selected with a single click, you can either right-click your mouse and click the Copy button. Alternatively, you can hold down the Control key and push C on your keyboard. This will prepare the contents of the cell to be copied to a different cell. Notice that the cell now has a flashing dashed border around it to indicate a transformation is active. Cut transformation. Once a cell has been selected with a single click, you can either right-click your mouse and click on the Cut button. Alternatively, you can hold down the Control key and push X on your keyboard. This will prepare the contents of the cell to be moved to a different cell. As before, the cell has a flashing dashed border to indicate an active transformation. Paste transformation. 
Once a cell has a copy or cut transformation applied to it, the contents can be either copied or moved to a target range or cell. Simply select the target cell with a single click, then right-click your mouse and choose the Paste button. Alternatively, you can hold down the Control key and push V on your keyboard. This will result in the copied or cut contents being placed within the target cell. Note, if you are pasting a copy transformation, you are able to do additional paste transformations without needing to redo the copy transformation. Undo transformation. This is an incredibly helpful transformation, and I personally use this one all the time. If you complete an action in Excel, and either make a mistake or the action has an unintended or undesired outcome, we can simply undo it. There are two ways to perform the undo transformation. The first one is to use the keyboard shortcut by holding down the Control key and pushing the Z key on your keyboard. The second is to hit the Undo button at the top of the screen. Move Transformation as an alternative to performing a cut and paste transformation, it is possible to simply drag a cell's contents to a target cell. Hovering your mouse over the green cell border will change it to a four arrow icon. Once this appears, you can click and hold the border and drag the cell and its contents to the target location. These transformations are extremely helpful and will save you a lot of time in the long run so I encourage you to commit these to memory if you haven't already done so. The previous transformations are very useful, but are not predictive in nature. That means that you can only transform data that exists by copying, pasting, moving, etc. However, there are often times where we will have information that we want to enter without manually entering every single data point. This is where Excel has introduced a very handy feature called Autofill, which addresses this exact problem. The way Autofill works is that it identifies patterns from a selected range of data, and then populates more data into cells as you drag the cursor. For example, you can see in the A column, I have selected a range of numbers that start at 1 in A1 and increase by 1 as you go down each row. So a 2 is 2 a 3 is 3, and so on. I activate the autofill function by placing my cursor at the bottom right of the selection, and then simply drag the cursor down until the dataset has automatically populated however many data points I wanted. In this case, I used autofill to populate down to A10 with the number 10. Again, this might seem like a trivial saving of time, but think about if you needed to enter 10,000 data points. The larger the dataset, the higher the time savings, and the greater the reduction of mind-numbing manual data entry. As we saw on the previous slide, autofill can be a huge time saver whilst reducing down the potential for human input error. Autofill can take a guess at what you want to do with only a single data point, but as you could imagine, this is often going to end poorly. By providing at least two consecutive pieces of data, Autofill will be able to greatly increase its prediction accuracy. The important thing to highlight about Autofill is that it doesn't just predict numbers. It is able to predictively populate things such as days of the week, hourly times in a schedule or timetable, week numbers, etc. The main thing that is needed is some kind of pattern that Autofill can use to predict what comes next. For example, Let's say we had Monday and Tuesday as two consecutive pieces of data. Autofill would be able to use this information to populate Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to save us time. If we provided two times, such as 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., Autofill could use this pattern to provide 11 a.m., 12 p.m., and 1 p.m. Lastly, if we had provided weeks 1 and 2, Autofill would be able to populate weeks 3, 4, and 5, or however many weeks as we desired. For further great examples and information around the power of the autofill function, click on the Examples image.